In September 2024, at Eurosatori in Paris, we got a good look at Europe's newest and most capable main battle tank, the monstrous Leopard 2A8. But beside the 2A8 was another Leopard, perhaps the first glimpse at the future of tank design and the precursor to the main ground combat system, which is the vehicle that France and Germany hope to jointly adopt in the next decade. This new tank has a distinctive feature. There's nobody in the turret. This vehicle, the Leopard 2 ARC 3.0, is a technology demonstrator for what many think is the future of armoured warfare, an unmanned turret. Unlike the Leopard 2A8, which has three of its four crew members sitting in the rotating turret on top of the tank, the ARC-3 has its three crew members sitting in the hull, with the turret being a completely separate, remotely operated system on top. So how is this done? Why is it done? And why has it not been tried before? Well, it has. Sort of. This is the history, and perhaps the future, of unmanned turrets. Let's dive in. The ARC-3 is not the first vehicle to have an unmanned turret, far from it. Vehicles have had remote-controlled turrets for years, decades even. Remote weapon stations, the unarmoured, unenclosed cousin of the topic of this video, are commonplace on modern vehicles and can mount belt-fed autocannons up to 30 or 40 millimetres. Anything larger than this, like a tank's main gun, have, historically, been loaded by a human. Lift shell from rack, put in breech, close breach, bang, take out spent casing, repeat. However, the introduction of the auto-loader in the mid-20th century complicated things. The Soviets adopted this technology in the 1960s and have kept it ever since. As a result, their vehicles were more compact, operating with crews of three rather than four. So this begged the question, why do we need crew in the turret at all? We could move the gunner and the commander to the hull. They could still aim and fire the gun remotely, looking around using cameras and screens, allowing the turret to be significantly smaller. It means you also only really need to armour the small section of the hull that the crew sit in, allowing them to be isolated from the dangerous collection of explosives in the turret, all while saving weight. This is genius. But before we get into the pros and cons, a short word from today's sponsor, Raycon. It's summertime now, or at least I'm told it is. Everyone that doesn't live in the UK is now getting more warmth, more light, more time outside in the sun. But we all need a partner that can keep up, so we can enjoy our favourite music, podcasts and calls all day long. That partner is the Everyday Earbuds by Raycon. These earbuds are the ideal summer accessory for the gym, your work, going for a run or taking phone calls on the go, offering premium audio at an accessible price point. This is now my ninth month of using the Everyday Earbuds and they've not disappointed me, with 32 hour battery life, multi-point connectivity, quick charging and active noise cancelling. Despite the fickle weather lately, I've been outside a lot and it's been great to be able to take my music with me, with the five different sizes of tips, making sure that they stay in my ears and fit comfortably and the lovely looking protective case cover helping to keep them safe. They were already an incredible deal, but go to buyraycon.com forward slash RWF today to get 15% off Raycon's everyday earbuds and help support the channel. You'll be annoyed you didn't get a pair sooner, and if you don't love them for whatever reason, it's a 30-day happiness guarantee. Okay, so turrets. Many nations have toyed with the idea of unmanned turrets, but the Russians were the first to put this type of vehicle into service with the T-14 Armada in 2014. Many heralded the T-14 as the first of the next generation of main battle tanks, especially given the perceived poor performance of legacy AFVs in Ukraine. The ARC-3 is the latest evolution of the unmanned turret design. Previous designs like the American M1 TTB or T-14 still use a traditional turret basket within the hull that stores the ammunition and allows the gun to elevate as the breech drops into the turret ring. As a result, the crew in these tanks typically sit three abreast in the front of the hull, a design choice used by almost all unmanned turret concept vehicles like the Abrams X, KF-51U and the NG-MBT. But this limits you somewhat. The crew having to sit three abreast means you have to make this armoured capsule at least three shoulder widths wide. Tanks are somewhat width limited due to train cars, ships and tunnels, so you're left with a lot less room either side of the crew to armour the crew capsule. 
The ARC-3 has a turret that is completely separate from the hull. It simply sits on top, housing the gun, all the ammunition, and all rotation mechanisms. This allows you to move the commander and the gunner backwards, under the turret, and means you can provide significantly more side armour for the crew. They manage this by mounting the gun on a double trunnion, giving it two points of rotation and allowing the breach to stay above the line of the hull. So, why hasn't every nation adopted this design? Why is it that only Russia has even attempted to adopt a main battle tank with an unmanned turret? It can be better protected, lighter weight, more survivable and require less crew to operate, and we've known this since the 1980s. The unmanned turret comes with its own drawbacks, and I'll let you decide if the advantages are worth it. We've already covered the fact that having all of your crew in the hull in a heavily armoured capsule drastically improves crew survivability. More armour protection, separation from the ammunition, and a reduced risk of injury, as you don't have to handle explosives or operate next to fast-moving machinery. But, being completely separate from the gun and ammunition brings up the obvious question. What do you do if the main gun or coaxial machine gun jam? This issue essentially killed the M1128 MGS. It kept jamming, and nobody could access the mechanism to unjam it, mission killing the vehicle. Of course, you could argue that that issue was specific to that design. Many autoloaders have been proven to function perfectly well over long periods without jamming. These modern autoloaders have been proven to load and unload shells just as fast as a human, and they don't get tired, and you don't have to pay them or feed them. Reducing the crew to three men has a lot of advantages. Auto loaders may be complex and expensive, but many militaries are limited more by their manpower these days rather than how expensive the equipment is. The thing is that the rest of the tank still needs the same amount of maintenance, if not more. The tracks need tensioned, the ammunition needs loaded, the engine needs serviced, etc. And you've got one less person to do it. And this is not an insurmountable issue, as Eastern nations demonstrated with their functional three-man crews, but it's certainly a trade-off. Okay. Man turrets have lots of vision ports, sights, and scopes to allow the crew to see outside. This gives pretty unparalleled situational awareness. The Mark I eyeball has yet to be beat. But in an unmanned turret, you need to use lots of cameras. Cameras are famously not rugged objects. Neither are cables, connectors, or screens. Of course, all sorts of combat vehicles have cameras and screens. Remote weapon stations are a good example. But it's a bit terrifying to have no backup. You can't just poke your head out or swap in a new vision block. It's easy to be confident in the durability of this sort of technology until you have to drive 100 miles off-road in a vehicle built by the lowest bidder and then get shot at. Is this all going to be able to withstand the elements, explosives, electronic warfare? We're assuming that the unmanned turret is not as large as the manned turret, and probably significantly lighter due to it not being armoured. There's nobody inside, after all. This can allow you to create a smaller, lighter vehicle with the same crew protection and a lower profile. But this calculation works best for MBTs, big, chunky turrets with three men inside and literally tons of composite armour protecting them from every angle. As the vehicle gets smaller and smaller, so do the size and weight gains. The turret on something like an IFV is not very well protected to begin with. Many unmanned IFV turrets are actually larger than the manned version. The ammunition is often moved from the hull into the turret, which bulks it up considerably. However, this has freed space inside the hull, which could now be used to carry troops, casualties, or supplies. And this video is not to say one is better than the other. With all tank design decisions, there is compromise. The reality is that new tanks, any new tanks, are expensive. Modifying tanks is cheaper, and it's very difficult to modify an existing tank into an unmanned turret design. That being said, I'd be very surprised if we don't see at least some unmanned turret designs enter service in the next decade or so, especially as nations adopt new families of vehicles. But I've spoken enough. If you were designing a tank today, would that turret be manned? Let me know what you think down below. This channel often focuses on technological advances. In the early 1940s, when military technology was advancing at light speed, the Germans made a pretty massive leap with this. The world's very first anti-ship guided missile, the HS-293. This rocket-powered guided glide bomb would serve the Germans until the end of the war, 
sinking dozens of ships and killing thousands of people, but how did it work, and what happened to it? Lucky for you, I've made a lengthy video on the HS-293. This video can be found exclusively on my Patreon, where you'll also get early, ad-free access to all my uploads and access to the Discord server. It also helps support the channel and allows me to keep making content like this. I'd appreciate it if you consider subscribing. And thank you so much to those who already do. Anyway guys, that's it for me. Remember to like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more content. Plenty on the way. I'll see you then.